Yes! Michael McQuarrie, what can I say? First, I have to get your attention. He needs something dramatic. Now I've got your attention. Here's the thing. Whether it's Michael, the little boy, standing in front of those uh, old movies and then reenacting them, or if it's uh, Michael living in the weirdest, most wonderful place in New York City, or Michael on my little TV show talking like Jack Benny. This is an amazing man. I've never met anybody like Michael McQuarrie, and uh, it's so much fun for me because it's like really talking to Jack Benny. Well, I don't do it like Michael, but well, it's like talking to Benny. It's like being around all these great stars all in one person. In fact, you must remember this. A kid, well, that's all I know of that song, but it is a movie song. And Michael is a man of the movies and a man of show business and a man of a thousand and one faces and voices, but one big amazing heart. Time rushes by, life rushes by, but the dance, it goes on and on and on and on. Time rushes by, it goes on and on and on and on. for making all this business called theater and movies worthwhile. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> but the dance? As Turner Classic Movies said, I'm taking in, stepping in for Lon Chaney Sr., the original Man of a Thousand Faces. Right. And uh, Michael F. Blake, who did uh, the Chaney special with Kenneth Branagh, said, Michael McQuarrie is the new Man of a Thousand and One Faces. So here I am. Ladies and gentlemen, and all others, make your mind blank and come along with me on the cavalcade of a very shimmering, glimmering golden yesteryear. For I'm the Man of a Thousand and One Faces taking you back to the old fun club kid days of New York, the Trocadero, Divine Theater, the Cooper Square Theater, the Bonsoir, 88's, Boy Bar, all of them here for you one night only, for the man of a thousand and one faces. Are you ready for this ride? Yeah. Now, thank you, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Now, I'm going to ask your help. Oh, I'm Cab Calloway. Now, I'm going to ask your help singing with me. Uh, me first, and then you. When the time comes, you'll know. I'd like you to help me very much with the hidey hoes and the heedy hees for many the moochum. <laughs> Hey, folks, here's a story about Minnie the Moocher. She was a low down hoochie coocher. She was the roughest, toughest frail, but Minnie had a heart as big as a whale. Hidey, 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 hi. Hidey, 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 My first experience with Michael McQuarrie was at a film festival, and I had two films that were screening in that particular uh, year of this film festival. And uh, it was after the screening and after the Q&A, and Michael uh, came up to me afterwards in grand Michael fashion and, you know, insisted that we work together. And, you know, usually when 
that happens, you just don't know, you know, who people are and what, you know, what they do. And uh, so I was polite, but, you know, just trying to have a conversation with him. And he pulled out his phone and he started scrolling through all these photographs of him <laughs> in costume as these sort of these golden age of, you know, Hollywood, these sort of universal monsters. And, and I remember I might've even actually said out loud, I was like, what is this? Like, who, okay, what, what do you do? Like, who are you? I had a couple of guys. I knew them, but not really well. We'd had a couple of meetings. They wanted me to do some promos for a new film festival called the Ohm Film Festival. And so I said, you, you got people lined up and say, yeah, we got this New York actors in Kansas City and blah, and described him as some, uh, like people describe New York actors in Kansas City, you know, and I'm thinking, oh God, you know, I'm, I mean, how many times have we been through that? You know, here comes the guys from New York, you know, to associate with us Hicks. And I was expecting the worst and they pull up and there's about four or five people coming in it was on a Sunday afternoon. And so it, like he comes in first and he was like, coat over his shoulder, you know, a jacket over his shoulder, and an entourage behind him. And I thought, oh, my God, how am I ever going to get through this? But he walked in my, my office, and I had this big Ed Wood poster, and he looks at it, and he just goes ape shit. <laughs> you know? I mean, it was an instant bonding right there. And uh, he also looked like Jack Benny that day. He can look like, you know, a thousand people. And so I commented on that. And I said, I bet you could do a great Jack Benny imp impersonation. He immediately did a Jack Benny impersonation uh, that I thought was better than Jack Benny. <laughs> Showed it to my wife later that night uh, after I shot some of those. And uh, she first thing she saw is, oh my God, he looks like Jack Benny. And he didn't look like anybody. And, and we did some great promos. Uh, so that my first meeting was filled with trepidation when I saw him walking in and then turned into a lot of affection and love, and we just got along great. <laughs> Let me help you. Relax. Somebody should know better than to resist. We are everywhere. When I was very little, and single mom, and my dad was not around. I was uh, just in a lot of unknowing and lost. And, uh, you know, other people had brothers and sisters, and I had just sort of a television. And it was just sort of like sad because I never could really fit in with all the other kids. And Halloween was great because I got to <laughs> become like the penguin from Batman and Robin television show. And I really became him and the scarecrow from The Wizard of Oz. And I felt that in what my grandmother made for me, these little costumes that I was not unhappy anymore. I was able to transform into what to me was bigger than life and better. My grandmother and mom would sort of be happy because I was my own babysitter. I kind of took care of myself, but I was always so empty. It was just an empty, empty, empty growing up childhood. And then um, my mother, one of her bosses, uh, kind of said, Kay, you should get this kid out of, out of the house and take him into an acting school because basically to leave them alone and have me kind of be taken care of. So what happened was she said, hey, Mike, do you want to go to an acting school? And I'm like, well, okay, you know, but then I felt, oh, I'll be, I, it won't work and, you know, whatever. Well, I was in Portland, Oregon and went to the Portland Civic Theater and I was a child, very young, and um, I got involved with these mini masterpiece series and the story goes that uh, at a simple improv, 
that I walked into a room, and I think it was a simple one they give to, to children like cowboys and Indians. Well, I became the cowboys, the Indians, the stagecoach, the whole town, the bad guy, the bell, the bank, the money, everything all at once, and they all went crazy. And the Portland Civic Theater said, history, history was kind of made. Van Helsing, now that you've learned what you've learned, it would be very best for you go to you go back to your own country. <laughs> Come here. I touch your lips and all at once the sparks go flying. <laughs> Those devil lips that know so well the art of lying. It's, it's a very interesting process for me when um, explaining how I become what I become or whoever I'm impersonating or the character uh, on stage or in film. It, it's basically all the same thing. I have a process that um, I was lucky that um, I was sort of with some major teachers and even the biggies like Uta Hagen and, and, and some other people that I spoke to in private as people on the street went against with me all a little bit of their teaching. I mean, Uta Hagen was one that said, I want to be spellbound by a surprise. I want to see something that I don't see someone setting up. I want to be taken over by a spontaneous moment. And that kind of stuff resonated with me. And in being involved with the Academy and HB Studios, I, young, very young, I just was lost. So I remembered these kind of wonderful teachers and kind of icons in the world of theater and, and master classes saying, I was different. So I thought, go with that, be different. Uh, on set, working with Michael, uh, for me as a director was different. And Michael and I actually had conversations about this because he, um, I think that people generally let Michael kind of have his own way, and he Michael plays it how he wants to play it. And I had a very specific vision for Corvallo, and I had a very specific idea of how I wanted him played. And um, for me, uh, uh, I, it was an it was an exercise in bringing him down. So Michael sort of starts out on eleven, and what I needed was one or two tops. And I knew that I was going to let him go to 11 for the segments of the film where he got to be Corvallo in character. And the way that we did that was that I, I, I let him know, look, I'm going to let you do this big, huge, giant thing that you do so well. But we're going to do it at the end. And before we do that, I need you to do things the way that I need to do them, which is that I need you to be this tall. Like I need everything to be in the smallest zone possible. I need subtle and I need a uh, nuance and I need this just very lovely kindness. And then I need, you know, and I took him through this range of emotions. And what ended up happening was that, um, uh, uh, in a very gratifying way as a director, I have a film where it's a six minute film and this character really goes through an id ego and a super ego all in the same film and that's his arc and it really couldn't have been a lovelier experience actually working with michael and him he he's very introspective he knows what's going on in his own head uh he he uh, i once referred him to a buddhist book called taming the monkey mind i don't think he's read it yet uh, but his, his mind is all over the place all the time. But he also knows how to dig deep within. A, a good example, uh, we were doing a 20-minute <clears throat> film. It was an anamorphic experiment um, called Love Shadow. And 
I said, I want this really depressed guy. You know, it's kind of a love story about lost. It's about lost love and bouncing back uh, with no dialogue for 20 minutes, like a silent movie. And he said, well, I can cry on cue. And I said, no kidding. Took him down to that fountain with the, the blue stuff in the background, the memorial to the fireman. And he sat there and said, give me a minute. And he, these tears started coming. And I just started rolling. And this went on for like two or three minutes, you know. And I was going to use 10 seconds of it. And my music guy saw that and he said, I'm writing two minutes of music for this. So the whole opening of that show is a two-minute static shot of him crying. And people see that and they, you, it brings tears to your eyes. I mean, he, he can dig in himself, find what needs to be found, and then project it. each other for each other best friends and um, it was incredible that Kay I called her Kay some people go well, you don't call your mom mom it's, and I'm like no she was but we were friends so what do you call your friend you call your friend mom so I call my mom Kay and she'd say Mike and I would go what Kay and a really funny story I have to share this week I was always angry I was always unhappy and so I'd get into the car and she and she'd sit there and she'd look at me and she'd say Mike, pull down the the mirror, the 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 mirror on the visor thing right now. I'm like, why? She said, just just do it. So I go, okay, what? And she'd say, see your face, see how it, how it looks. And I go, yeah, what? She goes, wouldn't it be sad if it stayed that way for the rest of your life? That 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 scrunched up face. And then I just laughed, and we just laughed, and and I miss that. His spark, his yes, he calls it. Uh, he digs into himself. He reacts to what's around him. His entire modus operandi is, goes all the way back to his childhood, I think. of He grew up liking monster movies. It was like an escape. He had kind of a rough childhood from things he's told me. And uh, we all did to some degree. I escaped into books. You know, I, I was a big science fiction fan. He was a big horror movie fan. And, and then he, when he went to New York, he got into the whole uh, theatrical performance and everything. And I think what, what he does is um, he just channels all that stuff, you know, and he, he puts his own spin on it. You know, he can, he can dress up like anybody with a little bit of makeup change. He can be somebody else. He can also be a new character. We uh, created the Holly and Woody characters. One, one of the things I thought when I first met him was, I want to get him and Philip Hooser and put him in the same room and just turn on the camera and see what happens. And we sort of did that with our Holly and Woody characters, and we've done numerous little theatrical things. Um, so he, he really is, a, he's masterful at coming up with these strange and weird characters, and they work. For a performer like Michael, uh, finding your yes would mean uh, digging down, uh, doing the internal work to find your truth, and to find the the answers to the universe inside of you. So I think, you know, there are certain people that sort of reach outside themselves to try to find the answer. Uh, and there are people who spend a lot of time internally digging and trying to find the, the answers to the universe inside themselves. And Michael, um, you know, seems like the kind of person that really does a lot of work to dig down deep and find 
um, his own truth and his own uh, his own way. And he and and you know when um, he's truly a person who marches to the to the beat of his own drummer. And I think Michael finding his yes is coming to grips with the fact that it's okay to have a different rhythm than everyone else. Michael McQuarrie is the man of a thousand and one faces. You know, in this business, you have to do something that nobody else does so that people will take notice. Well, Hollywood has taken notice. I'm very fortunate, though, to be able to call him a friend, and an associate, and really a, a, a magnificent talent that doesn't come along very often. So here's to Hollywood, hooray for Hollywood, and hooray for Michael McQuarrie. I'll see you in the movies. To sum all this up, and to kind of put it in, in your own very special place, and in your behind the closed door, what I'd like to say as any type of inspiration or or sort of your own kind of drum, heartbeat is what I call it, the beat of your own drum, is to never, never accept anyone saying, that's dumb, that's stupid, what you're doing is stupid, don't collect stamps, making models is dumb. Don't listen to anything or anyone but here, and know that in here, it's connected to everything and to the universe. So whatever it is, for instance, I do this art. I'm also an artist. I'm an internationally collected artist. I do this art form called that I created my own self because I had to, I had to create something so I can eat also besides acting, is it's called your essence in seconds. Like I'll look at you and I'll go, oh, hi, how are you? I'm Michael McQuarrie, I'm blah, 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 Turner Classic Movies, New Man of a Thousand and Faces. And I'm, oh, you look great. And I do this quick artwork of them and you know what? I believe it, so they believe it, and so believe in you. And, and uh, it's, it's really important that to, in a way, get yourself in your own way of whatever it is that matters to you. Make that your trumpet, make it your, the writing on the stone or the bird in the sky, and please know that you're enough. So in a world of no, 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 you're not, no, 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 you're yes. <laughs> Thank you. Congratulations, we've achieved our ultimate triumph. The force has been destroyed. Who should we conquer next? We shall not proceed on our own until we ask Master Putin. I am Dracula. I bid you welcome.